Thank you, Dan. Good morning and welcome, everyone. I am Dean. I'm Sal Sedano, Dean of the Zarb School of Business here at Hofstra University, and we would like to welcome everyone to today's uh, wonderful event uh, here at Hofstra University. The Zarb School of Business, uh, through its Merrill Lynch Center for the Study of International Financial Services and Markets, is very pleased to present today's conference on international financial reporting standards, implementation and progress by U.S. companies. Today's conference will present the legal, accounting, corporate, and academic perspectives on the issues involved in the implementation of international financial reporting standards, or IFRS as they are commonly referred to. As you may know, the uh, International Accounting Standards Board recently responded to recommendations by the leaders of the Group of 20, or the G20 as they're referred to, the G20 countries, regarding accounting standards and recent decisions taken by the U.S. Financial Accounting Standards Board. In its recommendations, the G20 called for significant progress towards a single set of high-quality global accounting standards. To achieve this objective, the International Accounting Standards Board will work with the U.S. Financial Accounting Standards Board, the Accounting Standards Board of Japan, and other national standard, uh, standard setters. If you read your Darwin, you can kind of look at, you know, what is the survival of the fittest ultimately going to produce? Is it going to be where 115 countries are using something or where one country is using something? That's I won't answer the question, but that's just the question to be posed. You hear a lot of talk about principles-based versus rules-based, that, that the IFRS is very principles-based, which sounds good. It's based on a principle. Principles always sound like a good thing, whereas a rule sounds like something that maybe you want to avoid or get around. But, you know, where is IFRS? Is it, is it principles or rules or is it somewhere in between? Now, some people look at IFRS as being kind of fuzzy, you can almost do anything. And some say, no, it's something where it requires you to do one thing one way and no other way to do it. I mean, there, aren't, aren't, there really aren't options in some cases or aren't exceptions in many, many cases in IFRS where there are many exceptions in, in, in U.S. GAAP. There is also additional flexibility built into IFRS in the fact that even though IFRS is written by the IASB, and there are many countries that have carve-outs, that have exceptions, that have a way of, of implementing IFRS that's not quite the way the IASB intended it. And that may be because there are tax rules in that country, there may be statutory reporting in a particular country that causes them to, to uh, adopt the, I, the IFRS rules that written by IASB a little bit differently. So there is even flexibility within IFRS beyond the normal judgment process. Now, uh, we talk about IFRS and, and U.S. GAAP. You know, what are the more significant differences uh, between the two? You know, some of the very narrow differences and some differences you can drive a convoy of trucks through. Uh, inventory is one area. Uh, IFRS doesn't allow LIFO inventory accounting. Life of inventory accounting has been used by many companies for years here in the States to reduce taxes. It's a tax-driven uh, mechanism. Now, I understand that the, that the latest budget somewhere, stuck in a footnote somewhere, it looks like LIFO may be going out in terms of application for U.S. taxes. So maybe that difference won't, maybe the fact that there's a difference between the, the two uh, gaps won't matter anymore, but LIFO may be even going out for taxes in the U.S. Leases is, is the, the poster child for a rules-driven standard. There are many, many standards and substandards interpretations of lease accounting in the U.S. and talking about certain percentages that need to be met. You don't have that same degree of specificity when you're looking at IFRS. Revenue recognition is, is another area where there are tremendous differences. You have some basic standards in IFRS about a, a transaction being, being completed, and you've got the risks and rewards going, and it, it's a very principle-based standard where you have the same sort of principles in, in U.S. accounting, except you're basically dealing with five standards or interpretations in revenue recognition for IFRS. But when you're looking at U.S. GAAP, in addition to the basic standards for revenue recognition, you have industry guidance and interpretations, EITF issues. You've got about 140 different types of standards dealing with revenue recognition 
when you're looking at, at, US, uh, at U.S. GAAP. Uh, business combinations is a good example of where convergence has gotten pretty close. There are still some differences in, in, in business combinations, but that's one joint standard that's come together fairly well. Uh, there is some, still some difference as to whether or not you, you step up the basis of a company you bought completely or only to the extent that you bought the company if you bought less than 100%. Uh, and contingent liabilities is another area of difference where the IFRS will probably result in more contingent liabilities being recognized in the financial statements because they have a lower threshold for the, uh, for the booking of that kind of a, a, a contingent liability. If it's more likely than not versus the probable standard, which is a higher percentage level needed in, in U.S. gaps. Now let's look at convergence. Now, people use the word convergence and conversion maybe interchangeably. Uh, convergence is getting the two standards to get closer to each other, whereas conversion to IFRS is more like a light switch going on. You convert to IFRS and that's, and that's it. But conversion is a, is a more of an evolutionary process of getting the standards together. In, in 2002, FASB and IASB uh, got together and, and issued this Norwalk agreement, Norwalk being where the, Norwalk, Connecticut is where, where the FASB is. And they, here they committed to the high level of quality and compatible accounting standards. And they started working on a roadmap, and the roadmap uh, was, was reflected in this memorandum of understanding in 06, which was then updated in 08. And that memora memorandum of understanding comes up with kind of a blueprint for adoption of standards or convergence of standards between the two bodies. And there were principles underlying that convergence. One is that they should be developed over time, so you're not talking about something that's happening quickly. It's happening over time. It's happening with due process. And due process is a very important term that might have been thrown out the window in the last six months between Europe and, and the U.S., and I'll get to that a little later. The framework itself, uh, the, the elements of the framework are, are these, these listings, and they, if you look at them in independently, they don't mean a lot. They're just very high-level descriptions of the objectives and, quality and qualitative characteristics of financial information, the elements and when you could recognize something, the third item, measurement, is very important because that's going to be focusing on something like, like f whether something should be at fair value and what should the fair value standards represent or should it be at cost. Who is the reporting entity? How do you present and disclose things? What is the, 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 f the status of the framework as being authoritative? And how does it apply to, to not-for-profits? <coughs> Looking at the individual standards that are being, that are being developed in this timeline, some of them may appear to be overly aggressive in terms of getting them finished by the appropriate time because these are some big items here, reporting on discontinued operations, earnings per share, consolidations, derecognition. When should something actually be off the balance sheet in terms of a, an asset or a liability? Accounting for income taxes. The next item always intrigues me, emissions trading schemes. It sounds like something somebody should be put in jail for. But the word schemes used in the international perspective does, is, doesn't, isn't like the word scheme that we, that we used here. These are really plans. It's a very neutral type, type of a term. And then financial instruments with characteristics of, of equity and insurance contracts. Lease accounting. Now, and lease accounting may be as simple as saying all leases should wind up being on the balance sheet. You know, forget all of these distinctions between an income that's called, a lease that's called an operating lease and therefore just hits the income statement or a lease that gets capitalized and gets put on the balance sheet. It could be a very simple thing or very complicated. Financial statement presentation. Now, 2011 revenue recognition, again, that's the one that if they come to an agreement on that, you've got that 140, you know, it's 140 U.S. standards, interpretations, rules they're going to have to be somehow metamorphosized into something a lot simpler and maybe more principles-based. There were a couple of steps that got us to where we are now. First, in 2007, as a result of the focus that the, the former SEC chairman, Christopher Cox, had on, on adopting international standards, the SEC finally removed what they call this reconciliation requirement 
for public companies in the U. Uh, the, the public companies that are foreign issuers that file in the U.S. You know, foreign company goes public and files in, in the U.S. It had to reconcile its accounting standards to GAAP, to U.S. GAAP, which was a time-consuming effort because at, 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 over the years there were so many different types of foreign GAAP. Now IFRS is, is maybe one more general uh, type of GAAP you're looking at. But the idea there was to create one level playing field for, uh, for, for the foreign companies and to uh, allow easier access to them. They felt that they were being discriminated against in, in effect. So the uh, SEC finally dropped this reconciliation requirement. And the reconciliation requirement is only dropped for those foreign companies that actually use IFRS as promulgated by the IASB. So if you've got a country or an issuer that files under IFRS that uh, is promulgated by the IASB but is interpreted by France or some other country that may have their own exclusions, they still have to reconcile. This removal of the reconciliation then led to a concept release in 07 which said that uh, let's allow U.S. issuers to prepare IFRS financial statements. And that's it, just IFRS financial statements. You don't have to follow U.S. GAAP, which is really, you know, which, ha which had been the rule. And that's U.S. issuers, not just foreign issuers. And in November, uh, as Dean Sedano mentioned, that there was a proposal, a roadmap that was proposed uh, and, the, and the comment period is over now. A lot of comments have been received, and the roadmap is the roadmap to conversion in the U.S. to IFRS. Now let's take a look at, at what the roadmap is, uh, includes. The objective of the roadmap, again, is a single set of high-quality standards that enables an investor, a user of the financial statements, to, to evaluate and compare investment opportunities. Again, it's an investor focus. The SEC has very much of an investor focus and uh, it's under law. There are a number of milestones in the roadmap. Uh, the first milestone it is something, something that may be the, some, sometimes the more difficult one is to have accounting standards improved to such an extent that it will be, that the SEC will be comfortable in the conversion to IFRS. So a lot of that depends on the convergence process. You know, will there be standards that the IFRS will issue on a uh, kind of on a joint basis? Not, 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 not exactly on a joint basis, but working with the, uh, with the FASB, will the IFRS standards be robust enough that the SEC will be happy with them? And, and when we get into the timing of it, uh, I guess the more significant thing to me, the most significant, is when you get into the revenue recognition one, which could be a real bear to work with, is the timing of the roadmap appropriate. There's also a, a very, there's much of a, much of a political football that's in the second milestone, and that's the accountability and funding of the IASC Foundation, which kind of, which oversees the IASB, much less we have a similar setup in the U.S., but in the U.S., there is very much independent funding and governance of, of the overseer of the, uh, of the FASB. Didn't stop Congress from intervening recently, but uh, the IASC does not have that kind of independent funding, and that is the key SEC concern. Uh, and the, also, uh, and, 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 and intended to overcome that concern is their proposal that uh, is being undertaken to appoint a monitoring board. You know, somebody, some body of, of organizations uh, that would include like the European Commission, uh, the SEC, the World Bank, and so on, that would oversee the, the working of the, uh, of the foundation. Uh, some investors don't like that in particular. They like the concept, but they like investor representation on it. The third milestone is the ability to use interactive data, XBRL, uh, which, is, which is starting to be used now. And there, is, there was a, a so-called taxonomy, kind of a way of using this uh, XBRL interactive data for IFRS. That shouldn't be too difficult to do. The third one, sounds easy, not easy, is the education part, education and training. And that's for everybody, for preparers, auditors, investors, um, colleges and universities have to, have to really revamp the, the, the curricula. Uh, regulators, and it just, that list goes on and on, a very difficult thing to 
handle all of the education and training that's needed and, and to phase it in at certain times. They're also looking as the next step in the, in, in the, uh, or on the roadmap to kind of pilot this thing, see, see how it's going to shake out. L let's allow limited use for, for the larger companies. So effective for, for this year, for 09, for the December 09 years, they're looking at, at the 20 largest companies in about 34 industries. They figure about 110 large companies overall that would be allowed to use IFRS uh, in, its, in its U.S. financial statements as opposed to U.S. GAAP. And there are some people that are saying, well, you know, what about the smaller companies? Is that going to put us at a disadvantage? You've got a, a large company that treats something differently. Let's say it's a revenue recognition item that produces more income to the bottom line, and yet the smaller company can't do that. You know, what, what about us? Big date, 2011. That's the date that the SEC is going to kind of say, let's see which direction we're going in here. Are we going to make an absolute decision that, yeah, we're going to be using IFRS by a certain date, or, or, or are there things that are in the way that will just put off this decision? So it's, it's a date that they're going to decide to decide. They haven't decided yet, but they're going to decide to decide. And a lot of, uh, a lot of disagreement about that. Uh, a lot of entities are pushing for uh, a date certain of it, saying that we will adopt IFRS, provided certain milestones are met, companies will adopt IFRS by X date, rather than saying, hey, you know, we'll let you know about this in a couple of years. Uh, so, you know, people are saying, well, do we stop, do we go? It, it's very difficult to understand which, which direction to go. So you don't really want to commit resources, uh, you know, from an education standpoint, from a, tra a training, st training standpoint, uh, from a system standpoint. Uh, companies don't want to really commit resources unless they know wh wh what the decision is going to be. You know, it, it certainly from an education standpoint, you, you can't just turn a switch on and have a curricula change overnight. You've got to kind of know in advance, I assume several years in advance, when something is going to happen before you want to make the changes. Also, th there's an argument that a date certain will push the, SEC, the, the FASB and the ISB towards conversion, e even convergence even quicker if they know that this is the date that it is going to happen. The G20, uh, again, as Dean Sedato mentioned, the, they did provide a little blueprint saying this is where we would really want to go. Uh, we want to take, we want the standards that it's to take action by the end of this year. So there is something that when the G20 gets together again, they'll look to see whether something's been done. They want a significant progress to a single set of high quality global accounting standards. Again, they, they didn't say, you know, switch to IFRS by that time, but a single set of high quality accounting standards. There will be a lot of transition costs. Cost is part of what the SEC goes through when it comes up with a, with a new standard, when it proposes a new, a new way of doing things. And they're looking at transition costs being very significant. There will be political challenges, they warn. And yes, we can see the political challenges already uh, that, that come to the table, even in the U.S., where you have independent, uh, independent standard setter. Will there be a two-tier set of standards? Because IFRS is app will be applicable under the roadmap to public companies. What about the privately held companies? Hey, and, and also, if you, if you permit early adoption, uh, you know, will companies really get on the bandwagon early enough to adopt uh, if, you know, the if they don't know when there's going to be an ultimate decision to convert. They did say that we're not withdrawing our support for a single set of high quality standards, but there are a lot of consequences and a lot of implications that you need to consider. So at the end of the day, they said, let's have further study and appoint a broad-based advisory committee. Uh, quite often in, in, in Washington, when somebody at the end of the day says, let's have further study, the thing that's on the shelf for any number of time, years. But here, they're saying, let's kind of go slow and make sure we're doing things the right way, which you know, certainly sounds like a reasonable approach from their perspective. From the investor's perspective, uh, investors are saying, yeah, we agree, let's have a high quality financial reporting language. And, but again, look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, the Darwinian approach. You know, looking at the survival of the fittest for the best of breed. Let's get the best of the standards that both IFRS and FASB have adopted and to see what, what makes sense as, as best. You do, do need on this monitoring group that would oversee, hopefully, the, the IASB 
you, you need some investor representation on it. Uh, those students in the, in the, in the uh, audience here are probably in the best position of all because you haven't had to go through many years of having to apply very complicated U.S. GAAP rules. Those that have been in the profession a little bit longer uh, are going to have an increasingly more difficult time, I, I would imagine, to, to, to unlearn, to cut the umbilical cord. And at, at the end of the day, the uh, people in, in the preparer community and, and the auditor community are very used to asking questions about how do you do this, how do you do that. Yeah, I see what the standard says, but what's the journal entry? And that's the way we do things here. And, and again, it's, it's a mindset shift. The, uh, I call it the, the effect of latitude on, 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 on attitude. Uh, the, there is a, a way of, uh, of practice that some people have applied which, which says that, where does it say I can't do this? You know, if the rule doesn't say, but there's not a rule that says I can't do something, that means I can do it. It's kind of the, you know, the negative space uh, rule. Uh, and, and I would expect you're still going to have some of that, particularly if you have a, a more, a standard with greater latitude, and you are going to have greater discussions, uh, some disagreements between the auditors, the companies that they're auditing, and last but not least, the regulators who are, you know, there to second guess everybody. Uh, and in that regard, there's something called the professional judgment framework uh, that has been banded about lately. There's a, uh, SEC had an advisory committee that last year produced a report on, on improvements to financial reporting. One of the things they were recommending was, was a judgment framework. And the judgment framework would be to say, let's put something in place uh, by, the, uh, by the SEC and by the PCAOB that would respect a well-reasoned judgment. And because principles-based standards require more judgment, it's, it's that, much, that much more important. And last but not least, assume it will happen. You know, Darwin was right. Things do evolve, and, and, and the fittest usually survives after, after a long period of time. Uh, and I think it's, it's going to be very difficult to support two primarily different standards uh, in, in the world of accounting, you know, U.S. GAAP on the one hand and, and IFRS uh, on the other. Uh, when people would have asked me the question, you know, back in 1993, whether I thought that uh, international accounting standards would ever uh, reach this side of the pond, would ever be used by the SEC without reconciliation to U.S. GAAP, I would have said there's not a chance that in, in the world that that's going to happen. Uh, and, um, but what happened was, you know, over the years, this, again, this groundswell was coming out of Europe principally, big companies were saying, why do I have to bother with your crazy standards? I, I, we've got this, this international-based set of standards that are getting better and better. And by the way, in 2002, uh, in Europe, the European Commission said, any company that wants to raise capital in the public markets here will have to use international accounting standards uh, for their 2005 financial statements. That was a huge event and really, I think, represented a tremendous uh, uh, breakthrough for non-U.S. companies. And I would say that probably one of the biggest reasons why international accounting standards started to gain much more support was Enron. You know, if you look at the Enron situation, they constructed all these elaborate partnerships and arrangements to get uh, assets off the balance sheet. And U.S. GAAP is famous for having these crazy rules. You know, you take the you know, the amount that you've invested in the company, uh, you divide that by the, you know, gross national product and your shoe, sh shoe size, and you end up with an answer to the, to, the, to the magical, you know, question. And, you know, lo and behold, Enron, um, you know, the bottom fell out of that, and, you know, suddenly U.S. GAAP didn't look so much like the gold standard anymore. And, in fact, there was a huge backlash around, you know, all these cumbersome rules and how you get, you know, as soon as you create an accounting rule, you have a sea of investment bankers that come out of the woodwork and try to sell you a product that will help you to navigate around those rules. And that's what did in Enron. And in 2007, the SEC uh, assessed where, where things were standing. They had a couple of round tables uh, in Washington where they heard from investors and from companies about, uh, about IFRS and whether there should be reconciliation to, to U.S. GAAP. And surprisingly, a lot of the analysts 
who obviously talked to the investors, said basically it doesn't mean anything to us, whether it's U.S. GAAP or IFRS. Just give us economic reality. That's really what's key. And I think the SEC was a bit taken aback by that. Shortly thereafter, they decided to eliminate the reconciliation for companies that followed IFRS, full IFRS, and then um, came to the, to the SEC with those financial statements. And, uh, and <clears throat> in doing so, the, the, uh, the chairman of the SEC at the time, Christopher Cox, said, well, you know, if we're eliminating the reconciliation for foreign companies, why not eliminate, why not just go to IFRS for all companies? And people then started to think about, you know, gee, well, how about, um, how about U.S. companies? And there has been a dialogue with, with um, you know, investors and, and companies leading up to the roadmap that, that Wayne mentioned that came out. Um, well, actually, the, the SEC voted on that roadmap uh, in August to, to move forward with a, with a draft roadmap. Uh, and it, they finally actually released the document in November because, remember, around – August was when all the bad stuff was happening in the economy, and I think there was a lot of uh, hand-wringing and teeth gnashing around actually issuing the document. I think people are reading the tea leaves, companies are reading the tea leaves, uh, and someone asked the question, you know, what, you know, what uh, companies are actually the first movers around IFRS? And the first movers around IFRS are those companies that really see, I would say, an opportunity around IFRS. Uh, those that have multinational operations, as Wayne mentioned, uh, companies have to file statutory reports in their home countries or in their countries where they have operations. So a company like IBM, where they have 170 subsidiaries and, and file, you know, something like 500 statutory reports around the world, you can imagine it's, it's actually quite, um, quite an attractive thing for them to actually say, well, if the whole world goes to IFRS, we don't have to worry about French gap, German gap, Swedish gap, all these different gaps where, you know, you have to have all these different people kind of trained in their local gap, and then you just convert to U.S. GAAP for your, for your filing. It's just, it's very, very inefficient. And companies are seeing the opportunity to uh, build their statutory reporting around centers of excellence, one in each region, where you can do 30 or 40 countries out of one, out of one operation. It's quite attractive. That's from a cost savings standpoint. There's also an element of uh, improved controls that companies are seeing. When you have everyone understanding the same set of standards, when you have people coming out of college that are trained in the same set of standards as your consolidated uh, you know, financial statements, eventually people are going to be better coordinated, uh, more you know, sort of behind the, you know, uh, with the program when it comes to preparing financial statements. And so companies really see the opportunity to improve controls and, and save money uh, on, on the cost of, of compliance. This is not a question of if. You've probably heard this a thousand times. This is a question of when. It is going to happen. And, you know, I'm not asking you to ask for your money back um, on your education. <laughs> Obviously, when you all started back in, you know, whatever it was, 2007 or something, this was, you know, whoever would have thought this would happen. So, you know, now with all this big surprise, you're, you're playing catch-up. Not only are you playing catch-up uh, with, you know, kind of your, your career here in the U.S., you're playing catch-up with people all around the world who understand a set of standards perhaps better than you do right now. And these are going to be your competition when you get out of here. So really embrace uh, you know, IFRS and you won't be sorry. I will make my pitch now and I will make it early and often, which is that lawyers and accounting folks and business folks really need to work together uh, if we're going to make a, 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 a move away from U.S. GAAP, with which we are all very familiar, um, to a, a more principles-based approach under IFRS. And I think I can't emphasize enough that starting, starting that process early and often uh, and, and talking to your lawyers, um, although that may not feel very comfortable at the beginning, hopefully by the end of the process, uh, you, you may actually see lawyers as your friends. Um, the first date is, uh, or year, shall we say, is in 2011. And in 2011, the SEC is supposed to assess IFRS, including really four substantive milestones. The improvement to IFRS, sort of accountability and funding of the IASB, the education and training um, and readiness of companies for IFRS. Um, 
In addition, the SEC has to determine whether to proceed with IFRS. And that's really, uh, 2011 is gonna be a really important year. Um, 2014 is the current proposal in the IFRS uh, roadmap as the date for mandatory adoption of IFRS. And it's uh, currently intended to be applicable and required for use for fiscal years ending after December 15, 2014. So um, I, I think it's important to understand that although we have a roadmap out there, there, it, it, there will be a lot of water under the bridge between here and there. That said, I, I cannot stress enough that we need to start now thinking about that. I also wanna just make a note, 2011 is really, um, is really an important year for the IASB as well. Many, many significant economies are, um, and countries are shifting to uh, IFRS in 2011. So there is a real desire on the part of the IASB to, if there is a convergence project and on all of the existing convergence projects, to try as much as possible to get agreed standards by 2011 so that as the larger economies shift to IFRS, uh, in other parts of the world, they're not set with implementing one set of accounting standards in 2011 and then find themselves as the U.S. moves forward through 2014 with an ever-changing set of accounting standards. So I think, again, just my own, you know, my own view is that we will see a big push in the next couple, um, in the next couple of years um, to get a set of standards that can be implemented on a more global basis. So coming to IFRS and lawyers, and what do lawyers need to know, and what do you need your lawyers to know, and how can they help you as you get ready for IFRS? And so beyond the usual, yes, everybody wants and has a goal, accountants, lawyers, issuers, um, underwriters, everyone involved in, in the capital markets and, and the public disclosure arena wants to get the disclo disclosure quote unquote right. Um, but what does that actually mean uh, in the context of a world where the accounting standards are becoming more and more principles based? And while it is an oversimplification to say that if IFRS is, um, is principles based and GAP, US GAAP is rules based, um, it, it is true that um, it is true that the more more important principles uh, need to be disclosed and understood, and by regular investors, not just someone who um, who has an accounting degree or is you know facile with financial statements. And so, what that really means is that the disclosure that issuers and uh, registrants, uh, companies that file with the SEC and make public disclosures, need to, need to be able to explain the principles they're using and the impact of those principles. I have to say, I put property, plant, and equipment up here. I would hazard a guess that very few people are thinking about this, but quite frankly, under US GAAP, when you write down an asset, it stays written down. Under IFRS, if the fair value goes back up, you write it back up, and that, um, uh, that may not seem significant to anybody in the room, except from a lawyer's perspective. If you're, if you're not expecting that, uh, and you're an investor in the a and and the assets, things like, you know, property, plant, and equipment that you expect to go in one direction, fluctuate and can have an impact on the financial statements. It's important to understand that. And again, not something that anyone would think is particularly sexy, but it is a change that. Uh, again, lawyers worry about those things. So uh, just an example of a somewhat plain vanilla principle that um, where your lawyers will tell you, you know, that uh, that probably needs to be disclosed. So we'll go back to the <laughs> disclosure and liability considerations. Um, I have uh, I have often said, and, and many of my have heard many of my partners say, um, you know, good disclosure trumps bad accounting, um, and so. I think this will become true in situations where you have more principles based, and it's not that it will be bad accounting, it will just be accounting that has sub subjective decisions in it, and explaining how those decisions get made will be very, very important. 
So how, how do you educate your lawyers? Um, I, I think that's in part their job and in part, um, and, and in part uh, your job to talk to them about the, um, the various principles and choices being made and whether or not there are alternative principles that could be implemented. Some practical issues are um, you know, the impact um, on contractual matters. For example, many, many companies have loan covenants, uh, covenants in um, indentures, um, agreements that are calculated under US GAAP. And it, as you make the transition to IFRS, if those agreements don't have the flexibility to, um, to allow a switch, there will still be a dual reporting system. I think the other thing to think about is if a new agreement is going place, into place, think about how it may, um, uh, some of the decisions made uh, going forward if there is adoption of IRFRS will be reflected in the covenants. Um, the other thing is an impact on regulatory requirements um, and, you know, uh, there was a mention of taxes but also uh, for the financial services industry this is very important uh, and I have some clients who are, who are looking at this, um, you know, and a change to IFRS will impact how they, in fact, calculate their capital, their tier one capital ratios. And I must say they, uh, that those choices can have serious, uh, serious consequences. And again, disclosure consequences, if the adoption of IFRS is going to take a financial institution's capital rate, uh, you know, capital ratio from, you know, 14 or 15 percent down to 8 percent, uh, that is that is going to make uh, both a, that will both be a disclosure issue and if it hasn't been foreshadowed, uh, perhaps a liability issue. My view on on IFRS, at least from a from a warning standpoint, is is to be prepared and, and to do as much communicating, not only inside your own businesses. Uh, but certainly at, at the at the university level with with students and curriculum as you, as you heard earlier from Wayne, uh, but certainly on the investing public side and get that kind of information out because certainly what we've seen uh, over the last year and a half is a lot of emotion goes into investment decisions and a lot of emotion goes into the buying and selling of stocks and, and in an environment where you you're dealing with sound bites and little clips on the bottom of uh, CNBC and the whisper number and who's who's ahead and who's not, did you beat expectations? It's really taking an informed view of, of what goes into those numbers and, and not being afraid to, to kind of pull back, pull back the uh, press release or the financial statements and really take a long look at what's in the numbers. And some of the things you, you may find would be quite, uh, quite surprising. And some of that certainly comes from some of the new accounting standards that we've been seeing and rolling through, such as fair value. I think my favorite uh, piece of fair value is when companies can actually book gains in their own demise when the debt, the debt value of their own uh, traded debt goes down such that they're actually having gains. And that, you know, it, that, those are the kinds of things you need to take a step back and look at it and understand. At the, uh, at the New York Stock Exchange, we trade uh, over 400 foreign private issuers, and we've uh, been in the non-U.S. business probably since the uh, late 1920s uh, when we first started listing some Canadian companies. Uh, no surprise, most of uh, a good chunk of the, the non-U.S. list is actually from Canada. And as we've seen, and we've, we've taken a look uh, back at, uh, in 2007 when the SEC allowed the foreign private issuers their first, uh, their first crack at filing under IFRS, we've done some studies on that uh, as to who's doing what, and we're going to update that again in 2008. The non-U.S. list for, for 2007, what, what we saw was um, over, over the couple of 400 companies or so that we work with, about 44% still filed U.S. GAAP. Uh, only 21% actually took the SEC up on its offer and did, and did IFRS. Uh, and then the balance of that was, was home, country, home country GAAP reconciled then back to U.S. GAAP. When you look at those, uh, those companies on the I, IFRS side, no surprise, most of that was Europe. Uh, a good chunk of that was uh, well over two-thirds was Europe. Because again, the EU did most of the heavy lifting. They mandated that uh, you need some sort of version of IFRS uh, by 2005. So come 2007, certainly that's that's a good chunk of the list. Second for us was Asia Pacific on the uh, on the IFRS side, implementing that. When you look at the home country gap, uh, no surprise, mostly uh, probably evenly distributed between Canada and Latin America. 
Canada, as everyone has, uh, I think, said already, is one of the companies, uh, countries that actually came back and said we will uh, go to IFRS in 2011. So we would expect certainly as our, our list continues to evolve that we would see the IFRS number continue to go up. If the U.S. continues uh, to stay in the position it is, it will most likely be the only country not doing IFRS because most of the world has kind of picked and they didn't pick us. And some of that you could argue is probably backlash for, for certainly uh, other, other sins of the past, but uh, we will in fact probably be the last country to, to come on board, which is again kind of, kind of surprising when you look at the, uh, at the amount of talent and thought leadership that we have in this country. Uh, certainly by way of uh, the standard setters. And I think, as everyone said already, I mean, we, we're certainly interested in a high-class, high-quality, worldwide standard. We've been a proponent of international standards at the exchange probably all the way back to the early 1990s when our list began to ramp up. We, we had, at the beginning of the 1990s, probably only about 90 foreign private issuers, and now that list has grown to, as I said, well over, well over 400. It was higher at some point, but as uh, Businesses continue to change uh, on an international front and people's, people's needs change. When the SEC changed their deregistration rules a year or so ago, we saw a lot of the European companies that had come to the United States in the early 1980s kind of step out because uh, the SEC allowed them to do that. So again, we, uh, when, we, when we look at it, we, we see the train is kind of already moving out of the station and it's a matter of kind of jumping on, hopefully not to the caboose. And I actually like going last, LIFO or otherwise. And maybe that comes from years of just being, you know, uh, in the back of the classroom because of my last name. What News Corp is, most people don't really understand News Corp. They understand Fox, some of our titles. But when you say Rupert Murdoch, everybody kind of says, oh, that's Rupert Murdoch. That's his company. Um, we own 20th Century Fox Film Company, we have Fox News, Fox Broadcasting, we have 14 regional sports networks around, we have the Big Ten Channel, we have the National Geographic Channel, uh, we have, own Sky Italia, which is the number one pay television service in Italy, we also own B Sky B, which is the number one pay television service in, um, in the UK. We used to own DirecTV, we since sold our interest in DirecTV just recently to buy Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal. Um, again, we own, we were primarily a newspaper company. We own over 100 different newspapers in Australia. We own the four large, some of the four largest papers in the UK. Now we own the Wall Street Journal. The New York Post is also in that family of newspapers. Um, so we are a worldwide company. Um, one, it's interesting, we were always an AGAP filer. Um, for the, up until 2001, and the reason we switched over from AGAP to US GAAP was one of, you know, access to the public markets, I think uh, Glenn had mentioned that. Um, US GAAP was kind of the gold standard of accounting standards. AGAP was this fuzzy math accounting, nobody really wanted to be on AGAP, and no one really trusted the numbers on AGAP. And it's funny, I'm almost thinking that we're going back to AGAP when we say we're going to IFRS, because our guys in, Australia, who do IFRS, are really just doing AGAP all over again. So we're going back. I almost think we're going backwards in a way. You know, I don't like the, the fact that you know, the U.S. gold standard is now almost being eroded. Um, and that, that's what I look at. Um, so in a way, I feel uh, IFRS is going to have to come a little further along uh, before we really embrace IFRS. And I think We'll see that going forward, that IFRS will not be the IFRS today. It's evolving. It's changing. It's going to constantly change. Um, I, and we understand IFRS is not a matter of if. It is a matter of when. We understand it's going to happen at some point. We're not, you know, we don't have our head in the sand thinking, all right, I'll ignore it until the last possible moment. But um, we have started preparing for it. Actually, we have, uh, we did some statistics. We have over 50 companies right now that prepare IFRS financial statements. I would say out of the 50, we probably do it 30 different ways. But I think that's pretty common. I think most companies um, will tell you, if they're being honest, that it's very difficult to get everybody around the world to adopt IFRS consistently. So what we're having to do and what I'm seeing, you know, my group, I oversee a group that goes around setting policy standards for, for us. And basically we're coming up with News Corp gap where IFRS and US GAAP are 
somewhat different or there's gray areas, we're trying to find some commonality that can be um, adopted by both standards and claim US GAAP here and IR for us over here. And the one big area is revenue recognition. Right now, revenue recognition for us, um, and I'm also on a media council, all the large uh, media companies get together and we talk about, we have forums like this, and we talk about standard setting, and we talk about how we're gonna uh, comply with the various laws and the various uh, standards that are coming out. And IFRS is a real challenge for us. And I think the uh, conclusion that a lot of us have on IFRS is that we're not really gonna change uh, the way we see uh, income recognition in our specific areas. You know, once people understand something, it's consistent, other companies, they can compare News Corp against Time Warner, Disney, or others. Um, they have a lot more confidence that uh, what you're doing is correct. Now, I offer us, uh, um, anecdotally, I heard a couple of different people say that when you go back to IFRS, you're going to have those six companies applying six different rules, six different ways. Now, my, uh, my view on how News Corp is going to adopt IFRS and the timetable that's in there, I'm fairly relaxed because from my experience in the past, going back from AGAP to US GAAP, that was a project. And um, we could go you know, right back to AGAP just as easily. I don't think um, AGAP was that difficult to apply. You know, when you talk about education and uh, how, how tough it is to learn another GAAP, it's really not at all. I think US GAAP and AGAP are very similar. I think UK GAAP and AGAP are very similar. There are a couple of key points and bright lines that are very different. You understand those, and as long as you can comply with it and understand what those differences are and um, lay them out easily, it's, it's pretty simple. Accounting is accounting at the end of the day. Um, whatever you learn from your professors is similar under AGAP or US GAAP, it really doesn't matter. What I look at IFRS is just another set of rules that are coming out. It could be US GAAP, it could be any GAAP, but it's just another set of rules you have to comply and figure out how to apply them to your, your colleagues. Um, US GAAP and IFRS, I think, as mentioned, will converge over time. I'm fairly relaxed in that we're not gonna have to jump on this train right away. I don't think the train is leaving uh, quickly. I think the timetable that's uh, been addressed or been thrown out there, um, you know, this is my own personal view. I think it has to be delayed. I don't think that anybody in their right mind really thinks that it will be such a benefit to get onto IFRS sooner rather than later. I don't see there being a benefit for us going by 2014. Um, we're certainly not thinking about going earlier. We're one of the top 110 companies that can comply today, or we're not looking at doing that. Also, being a June 30 year end, we want to see, we have the benefit of actually getting on the next train after the one leaves the station because we get to see what everybody else puts out there. One of the things I'd, I'd like to also stress on IFRS is that there's a lot of hype. Um, I constantly get calls from, you know, whether it's KPMG, DNT, um, you know, the other, for BD, I don't think BDO Cybin actually hits us up for, but basically, they want to send a, sell us training. They want to tell us, you know, it's the old, <laughs> I see it as, uh, you know, Y2K all over, Sox 404 all, all over, you know, where Chicken Little's telling you the sky's falling down and that if you don't do something today, you know, the sky's going to fall on your head. I don't believe the sky's falling down. I think you can get around this pretty easily. I think, you know, a company like, our, maybe I'm a little more relaxed because we've been through it a few times. We've We've worked with multiple gaps and multiple currencies. Um, it's very easy for us to go in and out of gaps. Um, the one area where I don't think we're ever going to get off a of U.S. gap, and I think someone on that last panel mentioned it, is on bank covenants. Um, we have, in some cases, 99-year uh, debt uh, that was negotiated under U.S. gap accounting standards. Now, you say, well, why don't you just renegotiate with the bank and get it on IFRS standards? Yeah, we could do that, but you know what? Anytime you go to the bank and ask for a renegotiation, that's actually going to cost you some money. Um, especially in this environment, you don't want to go to the banks at all for anything. If anything, they, uh, they're going to get their pound of flesh. Um, so I don't know if that ever will raise its head again, but I think there may be a way to 
um, for bank covenants, and, and that's not a small point. I think a lot of people have bank covenants that have been negotiated under one gap, and now all of a sudden they're going to go to IFRS. So I don't think U.S. gap by itself is going away anytime soon. I, I see U.S. gap and U.S. gap expertise being needed probably for the next five to ten years. Now, after that, I think what happens, U.S. gap becomes IRFRS, and I, I think it will be almost a seamless exchange by the time ten years rolls out. I don't think U.S. gap uh, stays what it is today. It constantly changes. I think when I graduated school back, you know, in 82, there were only, you know, 80, 80 standards. Now we're up to 161. We actually stopped doing standards after 161. Um, they're going to a whole different uh, set of uh, rules, and now you, so I don't know what you're going to do on the CPA exam anymore, Dr. Slide. <laughs> Those slides are going to have to have no numbers in them now. Um, so it's very difficult to, you know, say that U.S. GAAP is, is something you have to learn. It's, U.S. GAAP is evolving over the last 20 years anyway. It constantly changes. It's not a static set of rules. So I see IFRS as being just one of another list of rules that are changing with U.S. GAAP, and we're going to have to evolve with it, you know, and I don't see it being a big deal for us to evolve. I think we can evolve over time, and I think we'll be able to uh, comply with the rules. I don't think the rules are going to be in place on the deadline. They do have to come up with a deadline and a time to start. They haven't done that yet, but my feeling is it's going to happen further on. There's no benefit going early. Um, because what happens is if you go early, you're just going to have to change everything. The rules are changing so rapidly and fast. I don't think IFRS today is going to be what it is five years from now. So if you adopt today, you're going to wind up taking things off your books that you potentially uh, didn't have to have. Also, just anecdotally, uh, some of the companies that have adopted IFRS, there's 20% more disclosure that goes with IFRS. That, that's today. We're seeing that a typical 10K, like for example, our 10K has roughly um, 110 pages. It would be 20% more under IFRS. Basically, all the additional disclosures, you have to lay out all the principles that you used in applying you know, you know, the uh, standards and the financial statements. So roughly, that, that equates to just more time on your financials, more lawyers' fees, more accountants' fees, you know, reviewing the financials. So I, I see it as a the Full Employment Act for finance professionals out there. You know, it's a good thing for the accountants to, to see it. When these rules evolve like this and when IFRS comes, it is a boon for the, uh, the accounting professionals. Um, all the big four and BDO sidemen are going to be uh, you know, licking their chops and getting into companies, trying to, uh, trying to give their expertise and give their view on it. And um, you, you do have to go to them because they, they are the experts for the most part. You know, they're the ones dealing with the SEC. They have their people on the SEC. PepsiCo is a global company. We, we operate in over 150 countries. So inevitably, we're already getting a lot of exposure to IFRS. Um, at this point, we use IFRS in uh, approximately 50 subsidiaries but in less than 20 countries, um, Australia certainly, most countries in the Middle East, Russia. Uh, in Europe, we expect to transition Spain and Portugal next year in 2010. But it's interesting because the IFRS claims to be in over 100 countries. And so it may seem surprising that at PepsiCo, we've only adopted IFRS in less than 20. Uh, and the reason for that is that in many countries that have adopted IFRS, it's only so far been mandated for listed companies. So wholly owned subsidiaries of PepsiCo have so far been largely exempt from IFRS conversions. And they've been able to continue to use their existing GAAP for tax filings and to use US GAAP for monthly reporting to us at PepsiCo. Now, my strong belief is that that's going to change. Inevitably, once you mandate IFRS for listed companies, you're going to ultimately mandate that as your national gap for all uh, entities. Otherwise, you condemn yourself to maintaining two sets of rules, two sets of training, two sets of exams, and in all likelihood, your most qualified people will get trained in IFRS because 
they'll want to be involved with the larger companies because they'll see that as more challenging, more exciting. So <coughs> sooner or later, and probably sooner, I need to develop a global PepsiCo accounting manual based on IFRS. Or I will find that my controllers in each country who've already applied IFRS mm -hmm. will be applying it slightly differently. Obviously, Bob, that's been your experience too. If a picture's worth a thousand words, there are two pictures I always look at when I try and decide, you know, are we going to go to IFRS or not? And that's in 2004, IFRS was still very largely a European creation. And certainly, you know, some of Australasia was there, but largely it was, it was seen as a European uh, entity. Um, since then, uh, things have changed a lot. A lot of major, major companies, Canada, Mexico, Japan, Asia, uh, China, uh, decided to adopt IFRS. So IFRS has truly become global over the last four or five years. At this point, when you look at the map, other than the US, in Latin America, Colombia is still uh, signed up for US GAAP. Parts of Africa and Mongolia have not yet declared themselves, but the rest of the world essentially has committed to IFRS. Uh, so the reality is I don't see this as an issue of better sets of standards. Um, this is more of a geopolitical power uh, influence issue. Um, the reality is it's game over for US GAAP. So we need to get past the denial, recognize that fact, and commit to IFRS so that we can best influence the future development of IFRS. Because you know, my contention is if we delay, we will ultimately join after the IASB has resolved issues of funding and governance, and we'll have far less leverage at that point. So my message to the SEC is to commit now while we still have a position of strength, because that influence is diminishing every day. Uh, IFRS is already a high quality set of standards, global companies, from Nestle's in Switzerland, to Sony in Japan, to Allianz in Germany, Shell Oil in the UK, all use IFRS. Now, I accept that the US legal system will require much tighter definitions in the application of IFRS, which will create a narrower range of possible outcomes. And the big four and the FASB will have a major role in creating that tighter range of interpretations within the principles of each IFRS statement. Now, as a consumer products company, we have done a kind of side-by-side -side of US GAAP against IFRS. And I do not expect to see a lot of differences between the way we're currently applying US GAAP and the way we will apply IFRS. Uh, you know, my 2008 revenue will still be 43.3 billion. There will not be any revenue recognition differences. Cost of goods will change ever so slightly because IFRS does not allow LIFO. But you know, the US Congress will probably eliminate LIFO as a tax position long before I implement IFRS. And, and really, can, you know, can anyone say that LIFO is a superior basis for valuing inventory? I mean, it's not fair value, it's not replacement cost, it's a kind of mathematical creation to satisfy a tax return. So okay, I kind of I suggest that IFRS probably has the edge over US GAAP in terms of a superior method of uh, reporting inventory. Um, IFRS will not allow me to defer the production cost of commercials until they're first, first aired. Now, it makes a small difference to me because typically I have some unfinished Super Bowl commercials at the end of December that I will report under other current assets. And that balance changes by about plus or minus $5 million from one year to the next, which is about 0 0.1, 0 0.05 of a penny a share. Um, so really the, the differences are at the very, very edge. And year on year, you know, it's, it's not a hell of beans. You know, what's frustrated me at times about the debate in the US is that many people seem to believe that somehow we can keep IFRS out of the US. You know, if we build a long wall or we inoculate ourselves against it or something. We can't do that. US subsidiaries of overseas parents will need to prepare financials under IFRS. Even for PepsiCo, my third largest bottler is Pepsi Bottling Ventures. 
They're based in Raleigh, North Carolina. They operate primarily in the Carolinas, but also in Delaware, Vermont, and right here in Long Island. Pepsi Bottling Ventures delivers to Hofstra. <laughs> They're 70% owned by the Japanese drinks company Suntory, 30% by Pepsi. Beginning next year, they need to submit IFRS-based financials to Tokyo. That came as quite a surprise to them <laughs> and to their Pricewaterhouse partner in Raleigh. And it's sort of kind of appropriate with the conference here that the Pepsi bottler who delivers here is preparing IFRS financial statements. It will not change the product at all. It will taste just as good. <laughs> but how many times is that playing out across the U.S. because of the increasing globalization of economies and the increasing investments in this country? So the big four will need to train their U.S. accountants, including in Raleigh, North Carolina, in IFRS. And then the next tier of accounting firms will need to follow in order to compete. And so on and so on. And so at some point, college courses and exam boards will wake up to the fact that IFRS is already here in the U.S. and is already here to stay. But until that light comes on, if we don't commit to IFRS quickly, we will end up paying to maintain two sets of standards. And that's why I'd argue that the one-time upfront cost is actually going to be far less than the cost of the inefficiencies of maintaining duplicate sets of rules for the next five or ten years. So as you can see, I am a strong believer in taking the decision to take the plunge and convert now, and then focus our efforts on making IFRS successful. Now, that said, I do not support the idea of a voluntary early adoption. I think that's a prescription for total confusion, so long as the SEC has not set a date certain. And though candidly, it, you know, it's hard for me to see why any company would seriously entertain making that change until the SEC makes a decision. Otherwise, you know, they do risk having to retrace their steps or just hanging out there for longer than they'd expected until the rest of the country catches up with them. because it's a pretty old company, and if you go to the city and you look at the subways, Mr. Parsons um, started the subways in New York, and Mr. Prinkhoff invented that third rail. So we go pretty back um, a long time in, the, um, in particular here in New York. Today we're about 13,000 employees, 150 offices worldwide, 2.3 billion in revenues, um, about half of them um, overseas. Employee-owned, um, so we're a private company, uh, 5,000 shareholders, um, we still have some exemption from the SEC, so we don't have to file. But what we're do, mainly doing is uh, management consulting, planning, engineering, program and construction management, um, and OEM services. Transportation, I mentioned the subways, the highways, etc., but power buildings, um, waste, wastewater, and environmental worldwide. Um, so these are some of our projects. Um, I don't going to go in there, but really... Um, we're a global company, over 100 subsidiaries, and um, like Cheryl mentioned, um, we, we're not quite went from IFRS to um, US GAAP, but we went from multiple standards, including um, IFRS, to one global standard, which is now US GAAP. But what you really have to focus on when, when you look at GAAP, IFRS, etc., cetera, um, is you gotta look at differences and you gotta look at common, common, commonalities. Um, and really, and I agree with um, some of my uh, speakers here that mentioned it before, um, there's not really much of a difference between IFRS and GAAP in the end. It's all debits and credits. Um, in the end, um, yeah, you, you mentioned with the revenues, revenues stay 40, 43 billion, I think you said, um, whether it's on IFRS or in US GAAP and there may be something in between. Um, that's also the experience that I have. Presentation was mentioned this morning. Disclosures is a big difference. Um, um, what we disclose in US GAAP, in particular, us as a private company, we don't really have to disclose so much. Um, with IFRS, it changes. FIN 46, if you are in a lucky um, situation and learning your courses about FIN 46, tell me, because we have no idea on how to do it. <laughs> in particular, Try to explain, even an auditor, even one of the big four, and I'm sure with BDO it's the same thing, overseas, what FIN 46 is, they have no clue. Um, so US GAAP has a, has a certain um, requirement there, IFRS doesn't. Um, 
revenue recognition. I think you mentioned this morning 140 page. I, I, I always thought it was about 200, but um, two literary pieces of literature in IFRS. But um, I agree also with my predecessors. When we switch to IFRS, there's no change in, in revenue recognition. So whatever we do right now, we have SOP 811 is one of the big ones that we follow. Um, there's a similar, um, the IFRS standards is relatively similar, and there are the convergence efforts. And a lot of the differences between the two standards really impact only head office. Financial instruments, derivatives, I think was mentioned before, generally, at least for us, treasury centrally, so we would have to deal that um, centrally. Okay, whether something is liability or equity really is an imp um, impacted you and your consolidated financial statements, stock options. I mean, some of the stuff where it's um, uh, really different is really only head office impact. So all these hundred subsidiaries worldwide, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, some of the other ones, M&A, divestures, um, joint venture accounting, also you can manage centrally. PP&E is an issue. Um, Buildings and um, splitting up uh, certain things for us as a company. We don't really have much in PPE So that would not be a big issue pension accounting. We're mainly doing in the UK. So it's pretty um, um, pretty um, uh, small portion But there are other in, um, areas that really should be focused on in, in your evaluation and that's on tax We mentioned it before LIFO will go away or not Treasury the covenants big issue. Yeah, you got to look at the covenants you got to look at um, your um, debt to equity ratios, etc. So if IFA says it's debt and um, GAP says it's equity or vice versa, yeah, there may be an um, issue on the covenants. Contracts, whether you consolidate something or not, um, and, um, and particular on specific accounting treatments. Performance metrics, internally, internal performance metrics that management is um, familiar with and follows all the time. Um, how, um, how to deal with those and yeah, things will not be uh, comparable anymore. But really, the, the, big, the big thing is and how to get to IFRS is, is really a, n a nice way. If, if a company, if you do it as a company in the um, best efficient way and the best way possible, use it as an excuse, if you will, to really streamline accounting processes and uh, reduce cost. And the last sentence here on the slide, focus on commonalities, deal with exceptions. That's something that I always keep in mind when, when I make those changes. You can continue following the most US GAAP policies if you want. You can continue to use them. They are more or less in line with IFRS. Maybe some of them may not be, but um, most of them. Um, so you don't need to really modify them, only if it's necessary. Um, if you use the same standards worldwide, one chart of accounts, one process, one system, makes it much easier. Focus on that one. And then you got to deal with the exceptions. Move most of the exceptions to the head office. It's less need for training on the new standards. It's only a few people at the head office here yeah, that you have to treat with, um, and you don't really have to um, deal with the people in the UK and uh, people in, in Australia and the Middle East. Um, you, you probably know what um, alternative accounting treatment opportunities there are and what, what you, you, you understand this, you can have the discussion with the auditors. You probably get more support if you do that centrally with the external auditors than if you have to deal with multiple worldwide. But, but really, what I don't see in summary is, I don't see it's a big issue. We can switch it, like my company, when we just switched um, two years ago to one consistent standard, it didn't cost us much money. Um, and um, also the experience from my previous companies where we switched, um, it didn't cost much money. So it's, um, it's probably something that we can do relatively quickly, but I agree with my um, um, predecessors. Um, we gotta have a date. We don't wanna be the first one because you don't wanna spend the money. You don't wanna um, um, pay the consulting fees to the, um, the various um, firms. Um, so let somebody else do that and then, then learn from them and then follow. 